Good afternoon. Welcome uh, to Wake Forest University's 2017 Founders Day Convocation. For the courtesy of others, we ask that you silence any electronic devices. And to mark this joyous occasion, please remain seated during the processional and the recessional. Again, welcome. You may be seated. And let us pray. Infinite and ultimate mystery, the people of Wake Forest call you by many names, God, Yahweh, Allah, Brahman, ground of our being. These names planted and transplanted here the great traditions of the world now growing in our garden. In the holy calm and peace of this time and place, let us hold lovingly in our thoughts all the people of our planet, those who are consumed by hatred and bitterness, those who make war upon their neighbors, those who oppress their sisters and brothers with any form of tyranny, and all who suffer in subjection, cruelty, and injustice. Let us recognize our solidarity with all who are marginalized or forgotten, with the undocumented, the deprived, the neglected, the other, and our common humanity, our pro-humanitate with all who bear the responsibilities that go with being educators. Let us remember humanity's ancient, primordial, and universal dream of peace that we live together in harmony no one exploiting the weak, no one hating the strong, each of us working out our own destiny, self-respecting and unafraid. May we seek to be worthy of our motto, free from institutional and personal oppression and contempt, pure of heart and hand, despising none, defrauding none, giving all people in all encounters of life the honor due to those who, like us, are children of the earth's great love, those who have gone before us, 
their faces now we envision framed in eternity's glow are once again calling us to a wider vision of the world, a world made more fair, more just, more equitable by our efforts. So may it be. Shalom, salam, amen. Welcome to Founders Day. It is our tradition that on this day, we gather as a community to remember our past and our early leaders whose devotion and ideals for Wake Forest laid a strong foundation. Those who followed built on that foundation, making Wake Forest a place of serious learning and deep responsibility to society. We have inherited a university characterized by a devotion to learning and to professional preparation for women and men, a place with a strong sense of community, of inquiry and creativity, of hope and dreams, of exploring and maturing, of finding ourselves and seeking truth, of educating the whole person. Even as we remember the past, we gather today to honor the members of our graduating class who are in the midst of completing their final semester of coursework while determining how they will apply what they have learned here to the next step of their lives. It has been a great pleasure having the class of 2017 here at Wake Forest. As a university, we have a long tradition of cultivating the imagination and nurturing critical thinking. Today, we anticipate hearing from three seniors who will show both of these qualities in their senior orations as they reflect on their time at Wake Forest and the ways the education here has led them to discovery. In this way, we continue a tradition of oration that is over a century old. Our time together today is also when we honor some among us whose distinguished service brings great credit to this university. Thank you for being here on this special occasion as we celebrate our past, and as we look forward to the future. Thank you. Good afternoon. Really effective public speakers, orators, have been celebrated figures since ancient Greece when lectures and performances in the Agora were the principal form of mass communication, as well as a principal literary form of the time. Orators remain celebrated figures in our contemporary culture, too. Think of those amazing TEDx speakers whose talks go viral around the globe in a matter of minutes. And I'll just take this opportunity to plug our own Wake Forest TEDx event, which will be happening this coming Saturday afternoon, titled quite appropriately, The Power of Curiosity. The art of the spoken word has long been a critical component of a classical or liberal arts education. The more educated the person, the stronger the rhetorical training one received. This is no surprise to us. We all know that the art of the spoken word is as necessary today as it was several thousand years ago. I could even ask you about this. Raise your hand if you've ever taken a public speaking course. Here we go. How about a formal graded presentation in any of your classes? Raise your hand. And how many anticipate that you'll be giving public speeches in your own classrooms one of these days for students or in a corporate boardroom or during a political campaign or even giving your own TEDx talk? I think we all would want to raise our hands for that. You clearly get it. Excellent communication skills matter. Although Wake Forest prides itself on its traditions, indeed we are here today celebrating our traditions, the tradition of senior orations is the only one I know of that has been in existence in one way or another since the school's inception 183 years ago. Think about that fact for a minute. Wake Forest students have been giving speeches since long before the American Civil War, more than nine generations. In Wake Forest's first year, the school boasted only 16 students, all young men. They organized a debating society that first year, 
And then the next year, they organized another one so they could have competing debating societies. 16 students, two societies. This makes me laugh, it makes you laugh. Only 16 students, and they're going to have their rival societies within a year. These societies were called the Eusalian and the Philomathasian Literary Societies. And for many, many years, they challenged each other to see which one could give the most erudite and persuasive speeches. And the winners were celebrated as anyone whose jersey we retire today or whose banner decorates the Joel Coliseum in the same way they were celebrated. So important was public speaking as part of a Wake Forest education that at one point in time, all seniors were required to give a public speech in front of the entire school in order to graduate. Now rest assured that no faculty member at any faculty meeting has yet to suggest, at least since I've been dean, that we reinstate that particular graduation requirement. In fact, we have long since turned this venerable tradition into a voluntary one. The speeches you about to hear, are about to hear were chosen from 31 essays submitted last month by students nominated by faculty mentors. Of those 31 submissions, 10 were selected by a faculty committee for public presentation before a public audience of students, faculty, parents, and friends. Another panel of faculty chose the three best orations that you will hear this afternoon. For over a century, the Wake Forest community has had the opportunity to listen to and learn from our gifted senior orators, and today will be no exception. So now let me introduce them to you. They will speak in this order. Our first speaker will be Richard Caban Cabero. He's from Winston-Salem, North Carolina. His major is the study of religions, and he has a double minor, women, gender, and sexuality studies, and politics and international affairs. And his, uh, his oration is titled, What Are You? Our second speaker will be Ashley Laughlin. Her hometown is Reno, Nevada, and she is a double major in English and French and has a minor in creative writing. Her title is Your Wake Forest Eye. And last but not least will be Cameron Silverglade. He's from Weston, Florida. He majors in philosophy, and his oration title is I Hope You Dance. Enjoy. Y'all can clap. <laughs> I'm not sure when it began. What I do know is that once it starts, it does not go away. What are you? What? As of asking what being I am, as of trying to make sense of the physical characteristics of my skin, face, body, foreign, alien, and strange, something to be made sense of. Are. As if change is impossible, as though growth does not happen to someone whose nose is just a little too wide, whose skin is just a little too brown, and whose physique is just a little too ethnic. You. Taking the focus away from the poser of the question, questioning the one who cannot pose as anything but themselves because their flesh gives them away. In the classroom, my thoughts were met with the skepticism of, what are you? In my first social circles, my presence was met with the fear of, what are you? Even as I sought refuge in communities I thought would accept me, in safe spaces, I was confronted with that damned question, what are you? My parents never asked me, what are you? See, I came out as gay long before they could question my sexuality, and frankly, we shared the same ancestors in our skin. So my parents never questioned my indigenous or diasporic qualities. My parents cared more about who I would become than who society thought I was. But my parents did not know all of the stereotypes of our people. They did not know that mainland Americans believed Hispanics took their jobs. They did not know that mainland Americans thought all Spanish-speaking people were from Mexico. They did not know that my brown body was served on a platter to satisfy federal diversity requirements. Fortunately, in the face of all of this, my parents posed a question that shaped my success. What do you want to become? What? Referring to profession, because no school has the capacity to strip away my brown flesh and clothe me in the pale skin of my Spanish ancestors. Do you want? Because they migrated from Puerto Rico precisely so that I could want. To become. This is the question my parents posed for, not at me, 
that instilled in me the belief that I could access all the privileges that this nation had to offer. And here's where Wake Forest seemed to offer a pathway. This school is where both my parents and I believed I would gain access to the necessary tools to navigate this volatile world, a world dangerous for foreign, brown, strange beings like myself. They were wrong. I was wrong. See, this institution didn't offer me a different body. This institution didn't offer me a different sexuality. I did not suddenly become naturalized because I learned how to speak properly, because I learned to place a napkin on my lap when I ate, or because I became friends with gatekeepers. What this institution did offer me was perspective. It gave me the opportunity to become while it illuminated the true nature of the world. It showed me who holds the keys. It showed me how they got those keys. It showed me why. And it showed me that just because I stepped onto the foothills of North Carolina as a US citizen did not mean I would be considered a member of the national community. Belonging at this institution has been the most difficult naturalization effort I have ever undertaken. Asserting my value and worth daily has been exhausting. And it was not until my final year that I found my place. But saying that I found it suggests that it existed. It did not. The community I share in at Wake Forest is a community I helped create. A community of queer misfits who worked together to build a collective home. A community that liberated us from the demands of tradition and respectability. A community of religious, racial, sexual, gender minorities, and a community that understood assimilation as wasteful of difference. This community was a haven for people like me, whose very existence defied the mold of a traditional demon deacon. So though at first, I couldn't respond. I am a complex mixture of Taino, African, and Spanish. I am the last of my family born on an island with a name that calls back to the slave trade. I'm the first of my family to attend an institution of higher education. I'm an angry, relentless student activist who believes that justice is long overdue. I am whatever you want me to be, a chameleon, able to use the correct knife and fork or no silverware at all, able to speak properly or naturally depending on whom I need to take me seriously. I am my own, able to build my own path, willing to build my own gates. I belong. Wake Forest community, move from asking what are you to what do you want to become. Cling to the motto of this university and work for humanity greater than yourself. Work to undo systems that cause the pain of marginality. Work to remove racism, sexism, transphobia, and Islamophobia from yourselves and your classrooms. Work to use platforms like this one to uplift the voices of immigrants, of Muslim students, of refugees, and to discourage the celebration of people who work to do the opposite. Because black, Brown, queer, Muslim, undocumented, and migrant people are fighting to be considered fully human. If we stand for humanity, we must hold ourselves accountable and stay true to our standards, because that is the duty of a demon deacon. Finally, I leave all of you misfits in the audience with this. If you find yourself answering the question, what are you? before your well-rehearsed response spills from your lips, do what I do. I look down at the tattoos on my wrists and I say, I am worthy and I am enough. Thank you. My creative nonfiction workshop was a lesson in both writing and introspection, 
The professor's frenetic cerebral energy stimulated our classroom of 10 as we discussed contemporary nonfiction and the personal essays of our peers. This piece has a strong eye, our professor would say. He encouraged us to establish ourselves as the protagonist in our nonfiction stories, giving the reader insight not only into our voice, but also into our character. This narrator character is known as the literary eye in nonfiction writing, but it extends beyond the page. In writing a personal narrative, we conceive ourselves as a writer and consider ourselves as a reader. By examining myself through a narrative lens, I have come to understand the person I have been my four years at Wake Forest. As I write my Wake Forest narrative, I know there are moments I will choose to remember and moments I will forget. I learned in a psychology class that memory is flexible. As we reconsider our lives, we rewrite our stories. Some of this process occurs on a subconscious level, but I believe we can create our I consciously. I have heard that the human brain clings more readily to the negative than the positive, but I try to view my college experience with retrospective optimism. My story would have been meaningless without conflict. If I had never felt lost and alone, I never would have found my path. I learned from my challenges, but I do not dwell on them. The lonely nights of my freshman year, when it seemed like everybody but me was participating in Greek life, will all blur together. There will be nothing left but a vague notion that I once felt like I did not belong at Wake Forest. I will, however, remember the feeling of panic that hit me as I sat in my 9 a.m. class my freshman year and, learned, and realized that I had left my laundry in the washer. Afraid that a well-intentioned 18-year-old would put my line-dry-only sweater in the dryer, I ducked out of the classroom. I started to run in front of the first floor window where the history class that I had abandoned was still in session, then screeched to a halt as I realized that I could further incriminate myself. I recalculated my route and ran back to my dorm by a different path, hung my sweater on a drawing rack, and sprinted back to class only to find my peers in the middle of a pop quiz. I will remember the concert choirs last night in Dublin as we rode up a winding road to our final meal as a touring ensemble. Dr. Gorlick, our conductor, told us he chose our tour guide because of his beautiful singing voice. Our guide saved his talent for that night when he taught us the Irish folk song Molly Malone. Under the cover of Ireland's Dark Night Sky, we sang our most heartfelt performance. We sang all the way to dinner and all the way home and slept with Molly Malone on our minds. I will remember falling in love with French comic books or Bon Dessiné when I studied in Dijon. Every day I would go to the bookstore to purchase the next book in the series and at night I would devour the story. If I wasn't traveling, sightseeing, or wandering the streets of Dijon, I was poring over these books in the picturesque bedroom that overlooked my host family's garden. Two years later, thanks to a university grant, I was experiencing a Bon Dessiné festival in Lyon as an American researcher with a passion for French pop culture. I will forget the stress of finals week. I will forget the feeling of failure when I dropped a class that was too difficult for me. The moments of my struggle built me, but they have already begun to blur and fade. I build my narrative around the moments of clarity, the moments of wonder and humor, which are distinct in my memory. My Wake Forest narrative is the story of an 18-year-old girl who traveled over 2,000 miles from her doorstep in Reno, Nevada to come to Wake Forest University. I did not understand Southern culture. I once thought that bless your heart was an invocation on my behalf. <laughs> but I somehow created my story among the chaos of college life. Wake Forest was where my love of France was ignited into passion and where my writing became a key component of my identity. Wake Forest is a part of your story, and as we prepare to embark on the next chapter of life, I invite you to consider your Wake Forest I. How will you remember your college self? What are the memories you will cherish? The beauty of memory is that it allows for minor edits. I find comedy in the moments of confusion, occasionally glossing over my struggles in favor of successes. 
I can include my favorite characters, like the professor whose long-winded stories always made me laugh, and the campus employees who always remembered my name. I will highlight the roles of my friends and mentors and downplay the role of those who hurt me. Editing is just as important as the writing itself. I can soften my memories of sorrow by celebrating the person my struggles helped me become. As we graduate, we will be in a room with thousands of stories. Each story is unique, but they all have one thing in common. They intersect at Wake Forest. Some stories are unconventional, some are funny, and some are sad, but they are equally important. The Wake Forest Eye is a fusion of solidarity, empathy, diligence, and innovation. Our Wake Forest eyes will become the foundation for the eyes we become. These narratives will be our legacy, and our Wake Forest memories will function as companions for, com and for comfort and introspection in years to come. Prepare a three-minute self-choreographed dance to the song of your choice. You will perform this dance in front of the class on the first day of finals week. Best of luck. That was my final exam prompt for DCE 124, social dance. And after weeks of preparation, my partner and I were ready. Not calm but ready, like two seven-year-olds lying in wait on Christmas Eve. After some uh, classmates performed a lively shag dance to build me up Buttercup, my partner and I were summoned to center stage. Our song, Sway, by Michael Buble. Our dance, a tango cha-cha fusion. Now, both are admittedly different than the horror of my father's Russian ancestors and the jig of my mother's Irish clan. But after growing up in the vibrant milieu of Miami, or perhaps intoxicated by the sonorous tones of Buble's voice, I approached that stage confident in my tango and cha-cha. Now, in full disclosure, the presence and experience of my fiery Colombian dance partner did not lessen my confidence, but that is neither here nor there. The music emerged. Separated by a chasm of well-trotted dance floor and anchored by our classmates' expectant stares, my partner and I approached. Slow, slow, quick, quick, slow. Slow, slow, quick, quick, slow. We met in the center as Buble finished his lyrically apt third verse. Other dancers may be on the floor. Dear, but my eyes will see only you. Only you have that magic technique. When we sway, I go weak. Our turns were crisp, our promenades were dreamy, and our swivels, <laughs> our swivels. Lubricious. <laughs> now, the song's denouement was to coincide with our big move, a slight split on my part and an aerial flourish on hers. Buble's voice swelled. My partner leapt, and I lowered until... Shh! My khaki trousers split from center seam to rear belt loop, <laughs> unveiling an ocean of red plaid underpants. My classmates gasped, the room deflated, my professor shielded his eyes, and my college experience flashed before mine. I was transported to my first of many 14-hour car rides from Miami, Florida to Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I was confident in my talents and eager to, wait, to, to grace Wake Forest with my presence. No mountain seemed too tall, no river too wide, and no challenge insurmountable. I felt, in short, like a seed of untapped potential, eager to blossom.
Now, somewhere between Savannah, Georgia, and Coosawatchee, South Carolina, my mom turned down the radio. She said, Cameron, your father and I would like to dedicate you some songs, a sort of flying playlist as you spread your wings and leap from your nest. In typical 18-year-old fashion, I sighed and then haughtily obliged. My mom chose I Hope You Dance by Lee Ann Womack. Um, my dad played Coldplay's Fix You. <laughs> and I, I was annoyed. Um, this was all I could hear. When the tears come streaming down your face, when you lose something you can't replace, or this. Don't let some hellbent heart leave you bitter. When you come close to selling out, reconsider. But like most young adults straddling the chasmic liminality between childhood and adulthood, I didn't want to lionize a humility and glorify failure. I wanted strength. I didn't want cold place fix you, but William Henley's Invictus. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. So, from day one, I choreographed my Wake Forest experience down to the minutest detail. Mine would be the wardrobe with the most pastels, the resume with the grandest accolades, and, of course, the study abroad experience in the most exotic locale. But as I left port and began captaining my ship into the imagined paradise, I came upon rough seas. My ship sprung leaks, lots of leaks, all kinds of leaks. Girls wouldn't date me. Fraternities wouldn't want me. Not even the archery team took me. <laughs> but even when I managed to patch these leaks, the winds would die and the fogs would descend. Maybe the densest fog was the time my friend's dormant childhood Tourette syndrome returned in the middle of a long-anticipated dinner party. To cope, we went for a drive as he managed his episode. We screamed. We cried, we cussed, and then we laughed. The way you do when an invisible giant won't quite fall, when you find comfort and joy in the face of a friend right there with you in the bloody depths of the foxhole. Or maybe the denser fog was the day my grandfather unexpectedly died. I was on my journey home for spring break, excited to celebrate my birthday. But instead of reconnecting with old friends, I spent my 21st at his funeral. We prayed, we wept, we remembered, and then we laughed. The way you do when you cherish the sweetest parts of a full but always too short life. I didn't choreograph these moments, but in hindsight, I wouldn't trade them. They introduced me to life's messy dance. At my time of life, and perhaps at all times of life, there's a tendency to think that we can script each step with precise planning and hard work, that we are the masters of our fate and the captains of our soul. Yet over the last four years, I have had the pleasure of learning that life is full of the unexpected. Failures and flops, sucker punches and stalls. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying that striving and success are bad. They are important ingredients in a life well lived. But how we respond to the stumbles and scuffs matters, perhaps most of all. For character and grace are forged in the furnace of adversity, where the sweet is mixed with the bitter and the bitter with the sweet. So what does that mean for us? Well. When you spill your coffee, when you miss the bus, when the girl or the boy says no, when your best falls short, when your honeymoon is over, when it's not just a cold, and yeah, when your pants rip, make it part of the dance. Which brings me back to DCE 124. My classmates gasped with the room deflated. My professor shielded his eyes, and I we laughed, we giggled, we grinned, and as soon as we could see clear through our joyous tears, I seized my partner by the hand, and we savored those final musical measures. We chased, turned, swiveled, and chasseed, we danced. 
Like a flower bending in the breeze, bend with me, sway with thee. When you dance, you have a way with me. Stay with me, sway with me. Faculty, fellow graduates, members of the Wake Forest community, I hope you dance. We can see that proud oratory tradition is alive and well at Wake Forest. And now it is my pleasure to recognize some under, other wonderful students today. I will begin with our mortarboard students. The Wake Forest University chapter of mortarboard was established in 1969. Mortarboard is a national honor society that recognizes top college seniors for excellence in the areas of scholarship, leadership, and service. The Tassels chapter of Mortarboard here at Wake selects members who represent the top scholars and leaders of, on campus. Since its establishment in 1918, nearly a quarter of a million members have been initiated at 230 chartered chapters across the nation. Members of Mortarboard at Wake Forest are selected to serve during their senior year. Membership signifies honor, offers challenge, and represents potential for continued commitment. The challenge to the individual and to the group is to provide thoughtful leadership to the campus and larger community, to create an environment for effective communication, and to move towards identifying meaningful goals. The commitment is to extend the ideas of scholarship, leadership, and service to the community at large. Please see the names of our mortar board members in your program and I ask our mortar board members to stand at this time along with your faculty advisor. And all, please join me in honoring this group of seniors. Thank you. And now Omicron Delta Kappa. The Beta Circle of ODK, the National Leadership Honor Society, was installed in Wake Forest in May of 1939. Since its founding, ODK has initiated over 300,000 members, and the society recognized achievement in the following areas. Scholarship, athletics, campus and community service, social and religious activities, student government, journalism speech and the mass media, and the creative and performing arts. The purpose of the society is threefold, to recognize those who have achieved high standards in collegiate activities and to inspire others to strive for attainment. Second, to bring together representative students from all phases of collegiate life and thus to create an organization which will help shape the campus on questions of local and intercollegiate interest. And third, to bring together members of the faculty and student body on a basis of mutual interest and understanding. Exemplary character is primary consideration for membership. And let me call your attention to the names of these terrific students in your program. ODK members, along with your advisor, please stand. And will you all join me in recognizing this wonderful group? It is now my pleasure to recognize the student members of the Honor and Ethics Council, the Board of Investigators and Advisors, and the Judicial Council. The Honor and Ethics Council is the central deliberative body in the undergraduate student judicial system. Its hearing panels are primarily responsible for adjudicating honor code violations involving academic misconduct. The honor code is central to university life. Members of the community agree not to cheat, plagiarize, deceive, or steal in all phases of academic and social life. Administrative judicial hearings address violations of the university's standards of community responsibility as well as social honor violations. The Board of Investigators and Advisors provides students encountering the judicial process 
with qualified, caring, knowledgeable student representatives and provides the Honor and Ethics Council with full knowledge of the facts and context of a case. The overarching principle linking advisors and investigators with the judicial system is the search for truth. The Judicial Council collaborates with the Office of the Dean of Students to ensure fairness and due process for all members of the undergraduate campus community. In addition to these responsibilities, the Judicial Council hears appeals resulting from administrative and Honor and Ethics Council hearings. The student members of the Honor and Ethics Council are appointed by the President upon my recommendation, while members of the Board of Investigators and Advisors are selected by the Judiciary Appointments Committee. The student members of the Judicial Council are appointed by the President upon the recommendation of the Dean of the College. I wish to offer my very sincere gratitude to our student members. You play vital roles within the undergraduate conduct system and I am personally grateful. Please see the names of these students being honored today in your program and at this time will the student members of HEC, BIA and Judicial Council please stand and be recognized. Thanks to all of our student being honored today and I wish you much success as you continue to approach your responsibilities with integrity, respect and fairness. Thank you. Thanks Penny and congratulations again to each of you who have engaged in such important roles in the university. We will now present Wake Forest Annual Awards for teaching, research, mentoring and service information about each award can be found on the awards page of your convocation program. Eight of our faculty have been, attended, have been selected. The six who are able to attend are being recognized today. We'll recognize each award winner who is here by asking her or him to come forward when announced. The Eureka Faculty Award for Excellence in Mentorship in Research and Creative Work. This award is presented annually to two faculty members. One is able to be with us here today. As is our custom, the other winner, winner will be recognized internally by the department or school. The Faculty Award for Excellence in Mentored Scholarship in the Arts and Humanities is presented to Professor Stuart Carter from the Department of Music. Stu, please come forward to be recognized. Since 1982, Stuart Carter has been an inspirational figure to both students and colleagues. One colleague de described him as a, quote, model of how to gracefully combine scholarship, service, teaching, and mentorship. One of, one of Professor Carter's many grateful students wrote us, quote, he stokes the fires of my excitement, encouraging me to continue pursuing my interests to the fullest. He offers sage advice on how to craft a coherent argument from Latin texts, historical anecdotes, musical analyses, and poetic phrases. Indeed, Professor Carter's generosity of spirit has inspired countless of us students and faculty alike. The Eureka Faculty Award for Excellence in Mentorship in Research and Creative Work conferred on Stuart Carter. The Award for Excellence in Research is presented annually to a member of the faculty who is an outstanding scholar at an early stage of his or her career. This year's winner is Dr. Amanda Jones from the Department of Chemistry. Amanda, please come forward to be recognized. Our Dr. Jones strives to embody the Wake Forest teacher scholar ideal, her research in the area of gold organic chemistry is internationally recognized. Indeed, she received a five-year NSF career award for this project, generally viewed as the highest national funding honor that a young scientist can achieve. Professor Jones famously works hard to make her chemistry research topics more accessible to all students, those at Wake Forest and those at middle and high schools in our community. The Award for Excellence in Research conferred on Amanda C. Jones. The Donald O. Schoonmaker Faculty Award for Community Service recognizes extraordinary community service by a faculty member. 
This year's winner is Dr. Christina Soriano in the Department of Theatre and Dance. Christina, please come forward to be recognized. I thought you theatre and dance folks would raise the roof a little more than you did. Four years ago, Professor Soriano began a small outreach dance project for individuals living with Parkinson's disease that has grown to have far-reaching impacts on people with Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and dementia in our community and indeed across North Carolina and beyond. This work includes two scientific studies co-authored by Professor Soriano and others examining the ways improvisational dance can help with the mobility and balance for people who are aging. This is one among many shining examples of Christina Soriano's exceptional community engagement as a teacher, researcher, and scholar. The 2017 Schoonmaker Faculty Prize for Community Service conferred on Christina Sulis Soriano. Our John Reinhardt Award for Distinguished Teaching recognizes an experienced member of the faculty who exemplifies the ideals of a liberal arts education. I'd like to note that Dottie Reinhardt Alspa, widow of John Reinhardt, is attending the convocation. Dottie, would you stand and let us recognize and appreciate you? <laughs> this year's winner of the Reinhardt Award is Professor Gloria K. Mouday from the Department of Biology. Professor Mouday's award owes in part to her sterling leadership of our biochemistry, cell biology, and molecular biology programs. But as a true Wake Forest teacher scholar, she is especially recognized today for her teaching of undergraduates engaged in research in her laboratory. One former student exalted that Professor Mouday makes her feel, quote, like a peer discussing thoughts with a colleague and a valued member of her laboratory family. Another hallmark of Professor Mouday's mentoring is her insistence that her students communicate the results of their significant projects to the broader scientific community. The John Reinhardt Award for Distinguished Teaching conferred on Gloria K. Mouday. The Kalanick Family Omicron Delta Kappa Award recognizes an outstanding faculty member who bridges the gap between classroom and student life. This year's winner is Dr. Oana Trochescu from the Department of Physics. Oana, please come forward to be recognized. <laughs> Dr. Trochescu embodies this award as a scholar, mentor in the classroom, and mentor in the research lab. And her well-established research program fo focused on organic electronics Dr. Trochescu has inspired many students to pursue graduate research. One of her students writes, she's invested not only in our research and academic futures, but also in our personal well-being. She has left an impression that will impact my outlook on life far before, beyond my time at Wake. For your commitments to the robust academic life of the university, as well as the student experience, the Wake Forest Circle of Omicron Delta Kappa proudly awards the Kalnick Family Award to Juana D. Trochescu. <clears throat> the Reed Doyle Prize for Excellence in Teaching honors a faculty member who is still in the early part of her or his career. This year's winner is Dr. Michael Sloan of the Department of Classical Languages. Michael, please come forward to be recognized. <laughs> Tell Michael didn't know this was coming, he did not zip up his robe. <laughs> a challenging, encouraging role model is one definition of an excellent teacher. Wake Forest is fortunate to have such a teacher in Michael Sloan, a fine scholar as well as an exceptional teacher. Dr. Sloan demonstrates both his love of the classical world and his commitment to their well-being to his students. One of his students reports, Dr. Sloan's class had my heaviest workload at Wake Forest, and he was my most passionate teacher. 
He genuinely desires success for all of us students. For your commitment to teaching and scholarship, the Reed Doyle Prize conferred on Michael C. Sloan. I now recognize our 13th president, Nathan O'Hatch, for the presentation of the highest award presented by Wake Forest, the Medallion of Merit. The Medallion of Merit is the university's highest award for service. The men and women who have received this honor make exceptional and significant contributions to the life of the university and have helped shape the university's overall direction. In your program is a list of Medallion of Merit recipients. I ask all past recipients in the audience to stand and be recognized for your service to Wake Forest. Join me now as we watch a video about each of this year's recipients, Professors Jim Bearfield and Herman Urey. Oh, I came here looking for a job the, uh, in 1963. It was the only place I came for an interview, actually. The course of the day, I talked to people, and they uh, offered me a job before the day was out, and I accepted and been here ever since. He was such an incredible professor. You know, the, the classes were fun, the classes were interesting. I, I decided at that point, whatever he taught, that's what I was going to take. The first time I met Dr. Bearfield would have been when I interviewed for a scholarship at Wake Forest when I was a high school senior. He really showed that he had given my application a lot of thought and had also given a lot of thought to who I was as a person and was asking me questions based on those things as opposed to just a standard slate of kind of boring interview questions. My favorite place on campus, I suppose, was the honors room in Tribble Hall for many years. That's where I could do the kind of teaching I liked best and I liked the crowd in there. He has always been the voice that says the most important thing is the relationship between the student and the teacher. So many of the signature aspects of our university, of Wake Forest, of what makes Wake Forest, Wake Forest for so many of us, stem in part from him having shaped them. Uh, our study abroad programs are the way they are uh, in significant part because of his early work. The way they decided to start was to get a house in Europe that people would go to, which as it turns out was not the usual way to start, but it's the way we did. I taught Renaissance history. Very few people taught anything about Italy, and so I kind of got volunteered at the beginning. And after that, I went every five years, I guess. He, he always said that having the students abroad away from their parents. It was pulling students away from what they were familiar with and forcing them to examine themselves and examine, you know, something that was, was foreign to them. And he thought that was a huge growth experience, and it was. Well, it gets them out of their comfort zone, and it shows them their other ways of living. There's, and I suppose that's the major thing. It's hard to, to make people less provincial. I'm currently an orthopedic cancer surgeon, which is well removed from the history I studied with Dr. Bearfield. But, you know, the reality is that in terms of day-to-day -day impact, he has more influence on me than any teacher I had in medical school. You know, I think in terms of the values of the university and trying to embody some of, you know, the ideals of what Wake Forest means, you can't think of anybody better than Jim Bearfield. He's just got a magical quality as a teacher. and. Ultimately, as a friend, there are dozens of students going back four decades who find their way regularly to Jim Bearfield's office or house to catch up, to tell stories, to hear stories most of all. What he means to the institution certainly merits more recognition than he would desire for himself, I think. If I could have minored in Jim Bearfield at Wake Forest, if the college had allowed it, I would have. You have been a, a great mentor. You have been a great friend. 
and I think you have left tremendous impact on this university. I remember the first time I met Dr. Yuri, it would have been in my Biology 101 class freshman year. I was a biology major, so I took a few classes with Dr. Yuri. The one that stands out the most to me is the ichthyology course, the um, course about fish. And so at the end of that course, we went on a fishing trip. Really, that was kind of a turning point um, in my interaction with him. Kind of went from formal professor-student to more of a personal uh, relationship up close with him. As a colleague who came along a little after Herman, I always felt like he supported me, that he would listen if I had concerns, that he would give me advice. When I was in college, um, the professors I had, they told us to make sure that we passed what they taught us along and to make sure that you help someone else get to realize their potential as well. I think for a future deacon to look back on Dr. Yuri, he said, here's a person that really broke ground. He came here and did his doctorate here when there wasn't an African American on site. Came and took a job teaching here and excelled in this place. So I got a letter of acceptance from them, came in, night, in the fall of uh, 1969, and then in the spring of 1974, when I had finished everything, Dr. Rich called me and said that Wake Forest wants to hire you. And my first response was no. I've been here for five years, I want to go try something new, and I had outstanding offers from other schools. So finally, I decided I would come at least do the interview, and then decided that I would come back for a couple of years, and then I was gonna go somewhere else. Uh, spent 39 years, so a couple of years, 19 different times. When you start talking about your Ed Wilsons and you talk about Ed Chrisman and you talk about Bill Starling. I think you also put Herman Urey in that list of people that are the glue that built Wake Forest, the brick and mortar. Being honored for something that you did because it was the right thing to do is kind of embarrassing to some degree. You know, you understand why people recognize it. But what was important was making sure that Wake Forest lived up to its creed of pro humanitate. Thank you for just really being a positive example of a husband and a father, and then being very positive presence on campus. I would want to thank him for all of the service he has given Wake Forest over these years. I think a person never actually knows how special they are until you get to these moments. And I say that echoing the words of every African American that walked on this campus and met him here and said, wow, you know, Yuri's here, so it's possible. Jim, would you please join me here at the podium? Today we honor a cherished faculty member whose extraordinary intellectual guidance over four decades has earned him devotion and gratitude of countless students. The true teacher-scholar ideal. As you heard, Jim joined the faculty here in 1963 and soon earned a reputation as an engaging and quick-witted lecturer who taught a unique, entertaining, and thought-provoking honors seminar. His impact was felt not only through groundbreaking efforts to develop the honors program, but also for his leadership in study abroad and merit scholarship programs. He helped to build the overseas studies program into the nationally recognized program that it is today. He also diligently supported merit scholarship opportunities as mentor and advisor for uh, scholarships such as the Rhodes and the Fulbright. Throughout his 41-year career at Wake Forest, Professor Bearfield was masterful at cultivating the student-teacher relationship and his abiding concern for his students 
and their admiration and affection for him developed into numerous lifelong friendships. Although he retired from the faculty in 2004, he continues to serve the university as an expert interviewer in our admissions office. In gratitude for his four decades as the quintessential professor, his pioneering work with honors and study abroad programs, and his tireless support of students in the Merit Scholarship Program, Wake Forest University confers its highest honor, the Medallion of Merit, upon Professor James P. Bearfield on the 16th day of February, 2017. <clears throat> Thank you, President Hatch. Um, I was curious to see what Cameron's speaks would, in the, who made the video, uh, would make of my Wake Forest career. I discovered that, aided by our stellar uh, cast of characters, he made rather more of it than I would have. <laughs> uh, but he left out a couple of things. One, he said nothing about my athletic achievements. <laughs> uh, I was a little miffed at this. <laughs> but then I thought their peak came many years ago. Um, on a golf course with a student with whom I was playing, who said, you know you really aren't all that bad, <laughs> given that you have absolutely no talent. <laughs> uh, the second thing he left out I should contribute. It is that I'm very lucky to have had my career at Wake Forest. Um, except for the occasional meeting, um, I've been able to do things all ways that I thought were important to do. <laughs> um, including the most important, continuing to learn. And I was able to do that largely uh, through teaching students who also were teaching me. The other thing I've been lucky with is the tolerance of the people around me. Uh, colleagues, students, friends. Something which still continues in the admissions office where the young fry who are there uh, usually managed uh, to see me as amusing uh, rather than as appalling. <laughs> uh, it's been a good run. Thank you. Herman, you, would you please join me here at the podium? <clears throat> Since he joined the faculty in 1974, Professor Herman Edward Urey has been an exemplary teacher scholar and a pioneer in building an institution that promotes equality, inclusion, and diversity. Because of his inspiring efforts to create a better Wake Forest, both in and out of the classroom,
Today we honor him. He was born the seventh of ten children in Cora Peak, North Carolina. Professor Uri was valedictorian of his high school and attended college on academic and athletic scholarships. As an undergraduate, he thrived academically and became active in student government as well as the civil rights movement. After graduating in 1969, he was awarded the prestigious Ford Fellowship to fund five years of graduate education, which to our great benefit he did here at Wake Forest, and we are deeply grateful that you never left. He became the first African-American graduate student on the Rinalda campus, the first African-American to earn a doctorate, and at age 27, one of the first African-Americans to join the faculty. In 1977, Professor Urey helped establish the Office of Minority Affairs, now the Intercultural Center, that created that great foundation upon which we build today. His bold, innovative, and enthusiastic approach both in and out of the classroom earned him not only the respect of his students, but faculty and colleagues. He served as chair of the, of the biology department for several years and as associate dean of faculty development from 2006 to 2010, afforded him the opportunity to men mentor numerous young faculty. In gratitude for his decades of service as a gifted and inspiring teacher scholar, his dedication and commitment to the spirit of pro humanitate and his pioneering work for equality and diversity, Wake Forest University confers its highest honor, the Medallion of Merit of Professor Herman Edward Ure on the 16th day of February, 2017. Either I can see you or I can read. <laughs> so I will have to take my glasses off so I can read. President Hatch, members of the Board of Trustees, faculty colleagues, students, and friends, I cannot express to you what an honor it is to receive the Medallion of Merit Award for service to this university community. To be recognized for doing things that you thought were the right things to do is rather a humbling experience, to say the least. The mentors that I had during my formative years in both graduate and undergraduate school always told me and my classmates that we had to be a positive example for those who would follow us. They emphasized that we should give back some measure of what had been given to us during our academic training. Moreover, they challenged us to do for someone else what had been done for us. What I've tried to do at Wake Forest in my 48 years as a student and faculty person in this community is to honor that challenge. As you know, no one person is ever solely responsible for all the accomplishments that he is credited with by his colleagues, friends, and that is true for me as well. The diversity that we see at Wake Forest today and the inclusiveness that we continue to strive for could not have been done by a single person, and I am keenly aware of that fact. There are those Wake Foresters, past and present, who I share this award with because without their encouragement, guidance, and support, I would not be standing here before you today. It really does take the concerted efforts of a whole cadre of folk, a village, if you will, to effect change in any institution. And I am grateful to those who labor with me in my service efforts to this community. I sincerely hope that as we move forward, we will see this diversity and inclusiveness as the foundation of everything we do as a university. I believe that Wake Forest is the kind of place where a single person can make a tremendous difference if he or she is willing to open up his or her mind to being educated in every aspect of the human condition. Let us continue to be a community of teachers and learners that views diversity and inclusiveness as positive attributes rather than as negative ones a community that is focused on building bridges that unite us rather than erecting walls which separate us. I will continue to contribute to this community in any way that I can because I truly believe in what we are doing. It is indeed an honor, and I thank Dr. Hatch and the Board of Trustees for bestowing this honor on me and those who helped me during my 48 years at Wake Forest. Thank you.
Let's all give one final round of applause to the incredible people who have been recognized here today. So as you've heard already, 183 years ago, this institution was founded upon a basis of shared devotion to service for all mankind. This notion of service has expanded in the almost two centuries since the university's inception, stretching beyond manual labor to include an overall dedication to the betterment of universal human, human welfare. We have taken this commitment and interpreted it in every way possible, fully living out our allegiance to the Wake Forest community every day. The, the connection we share to our university and motto permeates everything that we do. Our three senior orators have demonstrated their incredible talent with words, walking us through the past four years in their shoes and encapsulating what it means to them to be a demon deacon. Our faculty members who received the teaching, research, and service awards have shown us the importance in cultivating an intersection between values and profession. And finally, Professors Bearfield and Yuri's lifetimes of service dedicated to Wake Forest have set a high standard for each of us in continuing to re reaffirm our love for Mother So Dear. In addition to these strong and capable leaders, the class of 2017 has achieved much more than merely making it through our four years here. With help from faculty, staff, and peers, we have thrived in our environments and discovered our true passions. We have traveled around the world to speak with international leaders, used our brain power to develop influential ideas and projects, and learned with an open heart and mind. The following video shines a light on 22 individuals from the senior class who have taken Pro Humanitate and the spirit of our university to heart in the amazing work that they have accomplished. While we are only on campus for four years, it is quite clear that our dedication and commitment to service will last much longer. And for that, we have only Wake Forest to thank. My favorite Wake Forest memory is definitely going to the Military Bowl and watching the Deeks win. It was a great experience and I got to travel to D.C. with my family. Favorite Wake Forest tradition, definitely Project Pumpkin. I had the chance to be involved in Project Pum Pumpkin for four years and uh, the service it does, it really encompasses, it really captures the spirit of Broken Man Adopted. My favorite Wake Forest memory would probably be homecoming. It was just a lot of fun, a lot of energy coming from the student body crowd. It was a like great being on the field with a lot of my friends. It was just one of the best times I've had at Wake so far. Being on the football field, getting our sixth win for the Boston for um, the bowl game, the first bowl game since 2011, and literally we were so ecstatic. The last 30 seconds of the game, everybody was like getting pumped, getting ready, and then we stormed the field. And I took a video and actually put it on Instagram, and it was just the spirit that was out there. Everybody was really, really excited. I think what I want my legacy to be is that um, I let people know that it's okay to have a unique perspective. It's okay to be unique and eclectic. So when I hope people see me or ask about me, that's what they get is like, he came here, he was himself. My favorite Wake Forest tradition is Love Feast. Uh, it comes at the perfect time right before finals when all of us are stressed out the most. The people, the relationships that I've made here are just, I'm in shock that it's only been four years because it feels like the staff, the, the students, I feel like I've known them like my whole life, so it's definitely gonna be hard not seeing them every single day. So many of the same people over and over again, you develop relationships, you get relationships with professors, and. The thing I'll miss the most about Wake Forest is the people here, um, from students, to professors. They've really molded me into the person I am today. Uh, I've definitely matured throughout my Wake Forest career, if you will, and without some of the help along the way from my best friends or professors or administration, I wouldn't be the person I am now. 
I'll be taking away a lot of different things, I think. Um, just a greater appreciation for learning, for other people, other cultures, and for collaboration and really getting to know other people and other ways of life. Um, most important lesson would probably be um, the importance of difference. Um, I think that in high school it was really easy to just hang out with the same people um, every day, but I think when I got to college I really made an effort to make different friends, um, people who looked differently from me, people who thought differently from me, um, and so that's been something that I think I've learned um, throughout my time at Wake. I'm going to take away from Wake Forest an understanding of our motto, Pro Humanitate. I came here with a different story than my peers. I came from a different background, but we all leave with a common sense of purpose. I'm going to take away so many lessons, how to do research, how to challenge and question things that don't seem right. I'm going to take away how to build a budget, <laughs> how to successfully travel on one's own how to do service thoughtfully and reflecting on the things that I've learned after a day's work. I think the most important lesson that I've learned at Wake Forest University is uh, that you stop asking yourself uh, if you belong, but rather you start asking yourself how you belong. And you start to question your presence and how does it truly make uh, this campus, but more importantly, this world a better place. And it starts to make you think about your significance in so many different ways. I think that it was the first time where I was able to live, study, explore with such a great group of people. I will definitely take away, I, most importantly are the lifelong relationships really. It's those, those people that I can call, you know, three years from now when things go wrong or when I'm facing a critical junction in life. Those people and their advice and their mentorship, that's what's going to carry me through I think the most. I think that I really want for people to understand or accept or embrace the arts as an opportunity for social action. Um, I have spent the majority of my time here working on that. And whether or not people remember me in that context or just think about our community that way. Pro Humanitate means to me branching out into the community. So when I came to Wake Forest, I realized that Wake Forest and Winston-Salem were not as close as they should have been. And so I, Pro Humanitate inspired me to really go out into the community and ask people, what can Wake Forest help you with? How can we, how can we be more present in the Winston-Salem community? And I, and I think Pro Humanitate can be expanded, that can be expanded for the country, for the world. When I leave campus, I'll take with me definitely a lot of memories. I've spent a lot of um, time here with different people, and it's going to be amazing to just look back at this time and just reflect on everything that's happened in my four years here and um, be able to see and reconnect with the people after I leave and just see how much of an impact they've been able to make as well. Pro Humanitate means switching a focus from your individual objectives to the group objectives of the society that you're a part of. Putting forth your effort, your time, and your energy to make sure that the lives of others are constantly increasing, constantly developing, and constantly being supported. The Pro Humanitate vibe within our own university, how everyone knows each other or of the person and are never afraid to interact. I, for one, I'm so glad we've got you seniors for three more months. I mean, we're getting very nostalgic already. Following the recessional, my office is hosting a reception for the campus community straight across the quad in the green room of Renolda Hall. Please come and particularly greet Herman and Jim, Professors Bearfield and Uri. I hope you'll join me there. Now please stand for the alma mater and continue to stand for the recessional, which will be directed by the faculty marshals.